The first thing you think of when I say NASA is probably the moon landing. It was truly incredible. Only 12 people in history have ever bounced across the lunar surface. But as impressive as that is, NASA has its sights set on loftier goals. Mars. And if putting a human on the moon was hard, putting one on Mars is crazy. The history of reaching the red planet reads something like this. Spacecraft did not reach Earth orbit. Spacecraft's radio failed. Spacecraft at the top of the rocket failed to jettison. Orbiter failed during launch. Orbiter flew past the planet. Lander failed due to fast impact. Flyby module and lander arrived, but lander missed the planet. Is this picture clear? Just getting to Mars is problematic. Earth and Mars orbit the sun at different speeds. That means the two planets are constantly drifting apart or getting closer together. If they launch when Mars is close, the trip could take as little as six months. If they launch when Mars is furthest away, add a year to the travel time. And if they miss, it's not like they can set up another rocket to try again right away. The cycle between launch opportunities is close to a year and a half. The journey itself is arduous. The living space is cramped. Bathing with water is impossible. Showers happen with moist towelettes. All food must be canned or freeze dried. Microgravity deteriorates muscle and bone. And if a solar storm hits, astronauts must retreat to even tinier protected areas of the craft. Assuming launch, flight, and landing are successful, all Mars astronauts will also become farmers on a freezing, oxygenless planet. They will plant, cultivate, harvest, cook, and compost indoors to have food rations. They must continue a self-sustaining existence for somewhere in the ballpark of two and a half years. That's the minimum amount of time they'll spend all alone, removed from their friends and family, before they can come back. And why? because they believe it's important. Important enough to take the risk, to make the sacrifice. When I say steamship, you probably think of the Titanic, and you are either thinking of a very terrible tragedy or a very long movie. Either way, passengers tell us that the only thing worse than swimming for your life from a sinking steamship is having to live on board one. On Christmas Eve 1901, Jacob Nelson Anderson led the first three commissioned Adventist missionaries to China. With their four-year-old son, Stanley, they left their home in Wisconsin and traveled by train to San Francisco. From there, they boarded a steamship bound for Hong Kong. This was 10 years before anyone would dare to claim a steamship could be unsinkable. At the time, Everyone carried living memory of tragedies like the Independence, which crashed into a reef off the Northern California coast, losing 150 passengers and crew. If our missionaries traveled in the steerage deck, then they were packed in like cattle with the cargo. When the miserable food was dealt out of huge kettles into dinner pails, the strong would shove and bully. Two to 400 people might sleep in the same room on bunks. Privacy was impossible. Available restrooms often equated to pots and pans. Unsanitary conditions frequently led to death. Did you catch that? Just being on a steamship could kill you. No icebergs necessary. And the trip takes a minimum of three weeks. Upon arrival, J.N. Anderson's escort failed to meet the missionary team. Stranded and exhausted, they immediately realized yet another challenge, communication. Mandarin doesn't use the Western alphabet, but unique characters for every word. Its grammar doesn't come from verb tenses, but from tonal inflection. Standing there with bags in hand, our missionaries probably felt a lot like astronauts setting foot on Mars. But they believed the work was important enough to take the risk, to make the sacrifice. J.N. Anderson's diary records him as a man with a rich heart for the land and its people. He and the others were committed. The first task was to learn the language. It took two years. The next task was getting from Hong Kong to mainland China. This only proved possible because of the efforts of other missionaries, both official and unofficial. J.N. Anderson met his neighbors, shopped at local markets, and shared his faith. 
On Valentine's Day, 1903, Anderson baptized six Chinese converts to Adventism. That's how the church started in China, six people. Anderson's appeals to the General Conference scored four doctors and two nurses, the beginning of Adventist medical missionary work in China. A Chinese church headquarters were established. Anderson's sister-in-law formed the first Adventist school. Anderson's younger brother was so inspired that he made the steamship journey out and joined the efforts. In the spring of 1906, J.N. Anderson passed the torch to Nga Pit Ke, ordaining him as the first Chinese minister in the SDA church. This one action opened the door for dozens of other Chinese church members to join in, spreading the good news. Today in China, there are over 400,000 Adventist believers and 4,571 congregations.